a software engineer at Yodel. We're, uh, uh, we're a small business marketing company, and I'm going to talk about our migration from a, uh, a monolith to microservices. It's a, um, it's a similar story to what you may have heard at uh, some of the other talks. Um, but we're going to talk about how we um, how we're making the same mistakes and how we uh, how we've used containerization, um, Mesosphere, and uh, and microservices to really uh, to really make things better. So uh, I'm going to talk about some of our um, some of our successes, some of our failures, and uh, uh, the various challenges that we've uh, we're, we're still facing. Uh, a long time ago, we created a, a monolith. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have done the, the same sort of thing. Uh, if you're lucky, it's it's testable, it's it's performant, um, it's it's hard to scale though. It's, it, often, if you have a monolith, it's it's hard to deploy. Um, you might start off with some manual testing. That's not reliable. Um, if a if a server's up, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, your service is up. Um, you're probably deploying infrequently because it's it's scary. Um, it's it's how we all start, but um, but I think we can do a little better than that. So uh, a few years ago, we started looking at a at a service oriented architecture. We we had some coarse grain services in in Tomcat. Um, we did some unit testing, some service level testing. Um, we had weekly deployments, which is better. You get 52 rather than 12 exercises of your uh, of your deployment pipeline. Um, we had some graphite dashboards to give us a little bit of uh, information into what we were seeing. Um, it was it was better, but services were still logically grouped into um, single containers. So you know, if one service in a Tomcat container was having problems, that might cause problems on that server, or um, it might it might take on the whole the whole thing. Um, but here we started having, you know, some um, some reproducibility and some some better insight into how our applications are actually working. So in the last year, and um, especially in the last six months, we've we've started moving towards HTTP microservices. Um, everything's Docker managed, so you can think about deploying Docker containers, not how do I deploy this complicated application. Um, everything's kind of the same. Uh, we've um, we've moved away from large-scale integration tests to um, to smaller functional tests, testing things in isolation. Uh, we have on-demand deployment now, which is which is great. So you can deploy at noon instead of 9 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, we also have application-level monitoring. This is this is really important. This is a, a key insight that we've had. We're, we're using um, New Relic for our our application monitoring, and um, it gives us really fine-grained insight into, into how our services are. are um, we have everything running on um, on Mesosphere, which is um, which has been good for us. There's um, there's been some challenges with it that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, of course, we still have a lot of our um, legacy monolith that we have to bring up to speed. You know, we're using the same strangler pattern that everyone's using, um, and we're starting. Um, you know, it's not just picking a piece; it's kind of easy to move. But we're looking at stuff that's around the the edges and um, and moving our way into that to that core. Um, eventually, that core will um, probably not be a microservice, but it'll be small enough that we can um, we can deploy it as a, as a microservice in our pass. And, um, that'll be that'll be better. Um, we still have some pain around shared data sources too, um, and that's something that we're we're actively looking into. So the the worst thing that can happen is a is a high risk release. Um, you know, with a monolith, you might have a, a slow deployment. Um, I remember doing some deploys. It would um, we'd start at 8 p.m. and around midnight, we would start thinking about rolling back. And um, you know, if your if your deployment's bad, how is how would you roll back? You're exercising that hopefully less. So it's um, it's a it's a big risk. Um, and if you find a, a bug after you've released, then what do you do about that? You have to do another deployment, and your deployments might suck. Um, so you'll have an outage. You'll have angry customers. Um, if you're, if it's really, really bad that you can't, um, you can't deploy, you're going to have to loop that bug for a week. So, um, so that's no good. Um, it's this is still a a problem with microservices. Um, your 
your bugs can be um, interactions between services, but you still have to really make sure that you have a smooth deployment process. Um, and exercising it frequently, making sure it's something you can do every day, twice a day, 10 times a day, um, it takes the risk out of that, out of that process. You also need a, a reliable rollback process. Um, it's hopefully if you're you, if your uh, your infrastructure is set up that such that um, you have immutable infrastructure, then you know you can just deploy the previous version, and that's that's easy. But if you if you fail to do that, you might have a, a flaky rollback, and that can be uh, that can be terrifying. You also need to be able to scale easily um, when you have. Uh, when you have a microservice, the, the, the real advantage of it is that you can just plop down a whole bunch of them. Um, so that's got to be easy, it's got to be automatable, um, but you need, um, you need service discovery, you need routing, you need, you need a way to, um, to, to utilize those microservices. Um, so automation is, is going to be very critical. The other, the other problem with a big monolith is, uh, is slow feedback. So um, we're, we're an Agile shop. We, um, we try to release things quickly so we can we can learn from customers. If you're releasing once a month, you're not getting a lot of feedback. If you're releasing two, three, four times a day, you can you can get a lot of feedback. Um, for a monolith, that what remains of it, you know, there's a there's an nightly regression suite. Um, it takes a long time to run, um, and we have to wait 24 hours for um, for feedback. With our with our microservices, we're getting. Um, we're, we're getting pretty much instant feedback. So it, it's a small piece of um, a small piece of code that uh, somebody can understand. You can run the tests in just a couple of minutes, and that's um, that's much better. It makes it easier to develop. Uh, it makes it easier to understand what's what's going on. Um, so I'm talking about microservices. Um, if you're not ready to use them, um, the the key metric is that. Um, Developing in your monolith or deploying your monolith gives you a sense of dread and horror. Uh, if you're if, you, if you're feeling that dread, then it's then it's time to move to microservices. If not, um, it's it's okay to wait. So we uh, to fix it, we started um, putting things in Docker containers. Uh, it it takes the it, it abstracts away all of the um, uh, all of the details of your application. You just you run, you run Docker run. Um, it reduces some duplication because you can you can layer things. Um, there are some other problems. Once you start using Docker, you need to think about where you're going to store them, how do you test them, um, how do you do service discovery, keep them up, debug them, view logs. Uh, so we're using a, an internal Docker registry. Um, we just push and pull images from it. Um, it requires a, a little bit of tooling. Um, one of the problems, we're using, so we're using the standard Docker registry that, um, that Docker provides. Um, run version one, they just released version two, we're looking at upgrading to that. Um, one of the biggest problems I found with that is um, it doesn't do any sort of cleanup. So if you're pushing a whole bunch of, uh, if you're pushing a whole bunch of Docker images all the time, then your, your disk space fills up, somebody goes to push, and you run a disk, then you have a, a corrupt image, um, and finding that corrupt image can be uh, can be challenging. And then you know you can't you can't uh, deploy. Anything. So we wrote some tooling around uh, removing removing old tags. So anything that's you know older than a week, um, we we untag it and we mark it so that the um, there's a there's another job that runs um, runs uh, intermittently that will actually delete the old images that aren't part of the tree. So we did a um, kind of a tree traversal to uh, <coughs> to see what images were stale, and we just removed those. Um, it's been it's been pretty reliable. Um, this is something where um, I'm working actively to uh, to put it on our GitHub. So if you're um, if you're using Docker Registry, you're planning on using it soon. Um, we'll make some you know, tools available. Uh, so we're using we're using Marathon. For uh, Marathon and Mesos for our um, our platform as a service, um, it's it's nice because it, it works directly with the uh, with Docker registry. Um, we we start out with a um, a, a bamboo build plan. We 
Um, we push that, and then the Marathon can actually uh, pull down from uh, from the registry. Um, so I mentioned we're using um, we're using Mesosphere. Uh, it's a so Mesosphere. Who's who here is using Mesosphere in production, or has played around with it? Just a couple of people. Okay. Um, so it's a it's a family of products for turning your data for turning your data center into uh, into essentially an operating system. Um, the the compute platform uh, it, it takes your compute resources, abstract them away, so you can use them as a as a single platform. You don't have to worry about the, the infrastructure. So it's it's beyond just um, putting them in a Docker container. Your whole your whole data center is some sort of um, uh, an abstraction. Uh, Mesos is just the the runner. Um, we also have a, a scheduler we're using with it, Marathon. Marathon is um, is a process that runs a, a beside Mesos and uses long running. Um, it, it keeps long running processes going. It's good for web services. Um, if they go down, it will it'll bring them up. There's a, there's a UI that lets you lets you use some scaling. Um, the UI is something that's a it's a little dangerous. It also lets you just delete apps um, from from production. So we've uh, We've built some tooling around that to, um, uh, to to make it to make it a little bit safer, and so you can get some insight into, into how your your stuff's working. The the Mesos ecosystem it's it's still young. Um, Mesos itself is from two thousand nine, so it's fairly mature. But there's a lot of um, there's a lot of tooling around it. Um, Marathon, there was a um, there was a bug recently. Where if there was um, if there was a leadership failover, um, if it had come, if it, it does a sort of a round robin um, uh, round robin failover. So if you if you come to a leader that had been a leader recently and it still had a cache, uh, what it would do is it would um, take down any processes that weren't still in that cache. Um, it's a bug that's been fixed, but it's uh, it's a risk when you're adopting stuff that's that's new. Um, similarly, we've uh, we've worked with Kronos for scheduling. Um, Kronos was a um, was an unfortunate choice. It uh, we we found that while it was it was good to be able to schedule a job, um, Kronos didn't um, it failed kindergarten essentially. It doesn't uh, it it makes some assumptions where it uh, it considers itself to be the only scheduler running. Um, So, so you, you basically have to have your own um, another cluster for running jobs. So um, you have to be careful with you know choosing the choosing the tools that you adopt in the um, in the Mesos infrastructure. Um, there's also some other um, you know technical considerations you have to you have to consider. Um, what happens if you have uh, um, if you have a failover? Do you have enough nodes to support all of your um, uh, all of your services going um, failing over and having to be put on other machines. So the, the way Mesos works, it has a, it's a master slave architecture, and um, it will distribute according to um, according to uh, whatever whatever resources that are available. It will pack your microservices and Docker containers into that um, in, onto those slaves. And when it does, a, when there's a when there's a failover, um, Marathon this the scheduler will see that all oh, the services I expect aren't aren't up anymore, we have to, we have to put them up somewhere. Um, so we have, a, we have some, some learning around, uh, around how much, how much headroom we have. Um, we found that uh, this was something we hadn't considered initially, um, but we found as soon as we started moving towards microservices, um, developers really liked it. So we, uh, we filled up our disk space, um, we, we filled up our, um, our slaves pretty quickly, and we, we, we're still adding new ones frequently. Um, so sometimes people will, um, you know, you've heard you've heard people talking about taking their their mom and just shoving it into a Docker container. Um, that that can work, but when the Docker lends itself to um, 
it, it lends itself to microservices. It leads to making your problem more, more composable. Um, what we can have here is, um, is piecewise releases. So if there's a little bit of functionality that you want to try, you can make a microservice for it, and you can put that into production. Um, it's, it's a little bit easier that way. And they're also easier to, um, they're easy to understand, easier to reason about. Um, you have sort of a, an enforced HTTP boundary. Um, with, with, a, with a monolith, you're making, you know, you're making calls to other, to other classes. But when you, when you enforce that boundary, you really have to think about the, uh, um, the interface there. So this is a, a warning from, from Clippy. It's if you have a poorly structured monolith, you can't just go and um, break it along those boundaries. You have to you have to think about your your architecture. You need to um, you need to make sure that you um, you consider how it's gonna um, how it's gonna work with microservices. And if you if you have just a, a, a big ball of mud, if you just split it along the um, the boundaries that you have there, you're gonna end up with another another ball. So the fast feedback that I mentioned earlier, this is um, the the real thing that I've noticed is it makes testing a lot easier. Um, we're we're starting to consider how we're going to do um, contract testing. We can test in isolation. Um, things are easier to reach about. So we have a, we've made a faster feedback cycle by um, by moving to microservices. Um, the the big bang regression that we had running overnight um, it just it grows and grows and grows. Um, and here we've had a chance to, to break it up. Um, and breaking it up it becomes even more important because we've taken what's essentially um, fast calls um, in, in a process and we've, we've turned them into network calls. So there's, a, there's an overhead you're paying there. Um, and that can, that can really make a mess if you don't, um, if you don't consider how you, uh, how you approach testing. Uh, another problem with a with a big regression is if you're testing real end-to-end um, -end things, if a if a service has gone down that you're that you're expecting to be there, um, it's going to make the piece that you're working on seem like it it's failed, um, and that's not necessarily true. The your code might be good, but there's um, there's some other problem, and that shouldn't necessarily stop you from uh, from from deploying from moving ahead. Um, so if you can if you can test in isolation, you don't need a you don't need a full environment. You can make statements about your microservices. Um, the most important piece um, I found there though is using um, uh, consumer-driven contracts. So where where we have where we have two services, um, one relies on the other having a certain um, having a certain interface, and so. Um, in order to, to make those isolated, what we'll do is we'll mock the, um, some downstream service, and then, um, we, so I've made some, some assumptions about the, the service that's downstream. Then I, um, I'll go to that other service, and um, I'll, I'll then assert that um, the things that I've, I've mocked and those statements that I've made, I can then use, um, I, I can see that they're actually things that are returned by that service. So I'm sort of doing a, um, a pairwise testing in isolation. Um, so I have uh, I have fast running tests, and um, they're they're reliable, and I've made statements on on both sides. Um, the the problem that we're currently facing with this is um, there's no way to enforce that. Um, there's nothing to stop a developer from changing a um, a consumer driven test. So that's something we're looking to build some tools. Uh, another advantage that we have is um, uh, low risk releases. Now, things that are running in um, in Mesos, they, they don't have downtime. The when we start up a new um, a new set of services, there's a there's a health check that that Mesos uh, that, that Marathon performs, and until that health check has um, has passed on those on those sets of services, the old ones are still in production. So um, now, if I say I have um, three instances of the service and three instances that I'm bringing up. Um, I'll briefly have six 
healthy instances, and the other three will come down. So now I have no downtime releases. Nobody sees a um, nobody sees a problem. I also have easy rollback because I can just deploy the old version. It's the same. It's the same process. Um, but the the coolest part that we've um, we built is is canary testing. Um, who has heard of canary testing before? Uh, is anybody doing it? So we've um, th this is this is probably the most innovative piece that we've we've put together. Um, we have three phases for uh, for a service. It's in canary isolated, canary partial, or full deployment. Canary isolated. There's a um, there's a there's a header that we use. I'm going to talk about our um, how our how our routing works briefly. So we have some um, some front end code that's going to talk to um, talk to HA proxy to go um, to go find the services, and it will um, it'll it'll do some routing to um, to find the the various services. Um, HA proxy. We, we're using um, another tool called Cupid Bamboo that um, listens for, for marathon events and writes HA proxy things essentially. Um, <coughs> so as things get moved around, we always um, we always know where they are, and you can always consider your your service to run um, on on port eight. So using HA proxy for this uh, for this routing gives us the ability to do um, to do two things. One is we can add headers to the to the actual request. And two is that we can wait certain instances. So, um, so it, it's instead of doing just strict round robin, it we can send um, ten percent of the traffic to some to some service. So this is um, this is kind of what our production environment looks like. Um, we're using um, Atlassian Bamboo for our. Um, for our continuous integration, um, new relic for monitoring, and we have a we have a tool that handles our canary orchestration. We call it we call it Cerebro. Our 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 deployment starts off with the developer pushing a button in in Bamboo, and that makes a, a call to Cerebro, which um, uh, lets it know that a um, a service is deployed. So we'll we'll put it in, in 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 production. We'll tag it as as canary isolated, and we have some tooling that will let us send uh, that let us let us send requests just for that. So any only things with this um, x canary isolated header in them will end up going to the the things that are being isolated. So we're able to drive traffic to something that's in production um, without um, without a customer accidentally hitting something that might bug. So what we're able to do here is make a statement um, about this service in production. So you've, um, you know, you've tested your uh, your code on your machine, and we've all heard it works on my machine. And so that it goes to the next, it goes to the next environment in the certification pipeline, and it works there. And then somebody forgot to configure something in prod, and it, it failed. Well, all your tests have passed. Your service is working fine, but something is wrong with the assumptions you made about the environment. Um, here we can verify those assumptions that we've made about that environment. So this is, you know, this is a really uh, important step. It's it's late. It's a it's a horrible time to find out that you've made a bug. Um, but to to really have that confidence that you've you've you can put something in production and that it connected to the right database, it connected to the right zookeeper, um, that that takes a lot of pressure off um, off. So we'll, we can also run some tests. We can do some basic smoke testing to see that uh, to see that it's actually functioning the way we the way we think it is, just as a, a last sanity check. Um, with our with our monolith release, um, uh, and I, a, a lot of you probably do this too. You once you've done your deployment, you you log in, you click around, you make sure stuff works. Um, just that's great as long as a, a customer isn't also clicking around there and finding the same bugs that you are. So I said that we're using New Relic for monitoring. As we're driving this traffic, uh, we, we can see certain um, response characteristics of the actual service. And uh, New Relic will give you a, you know, a, 
red, yellow, green score and saying that you're, um, you know, you're meeting your, your performance metrics or you're, you're failing um, or it's, it, it's iffy. Um, so we're, we're, we're actually able to make an automated decision with this process. If we're running the, the test and there's some, um, uh, there's some problem with the database, we're doing an N plus one select with a giant, a giant data set and it, it goes red, we'll roll that because it's better to keep that out of production. Um, if it's green, we're able to actually make an automated decision to move forward. So there's no person involved in this, um, in this stage, unless it's yellow. Um, if, it's, if it's yellow, there's, uh, there's an alert. Somebody, um, a developer, finds out about it. And they have to make the choice to, um, to move forward. Um, so in the next stage, we promote it to partial. It's the same. It's the same process. We're able to run some some additional smoke tests. We're able to receive some some bit of traffic, and we can leave it in there for um, for an arbitrary amount of time. And we can, without impacting the whole system, we can uh, we can see that it's it's working. It's really it's functioning as expected, and we have a lot more confidence that um, that this is this is something that's that we want to we want to continue to to move forward. With. Um, if it's if it's not good, it, it gets rolled out and it's it's not a problem. So we sort of dipped our toes in the in the pool. We've um, we've had a, a minor impact, but um, rollbacks are, are cheap at this point. So um, so it's not a it's not a big disaster. Um, the Canary Isolated also provides some some additional benefits. Um, we had a we had a service that um, was having some garbage collection problems and. Uh, it worked fine. We're fine on the developer's machine. We're fine in dev. We're fine in QA. And we put it in prod, and it, it was dying. Um, so we were able to actually, um, uh, using the using the charts from New Relic, um, see that uh, we could deploy it in Canary Isolated, and we could um, we could test it out and see exactly what was going on here. And so we could see that the new version was um, was having these these garbage collection issues, and we could um, we could verify that uh, when we de when we deployed the old version, we could see the same um, you know the same uh, the same metric, the same sort of behavior. So we were able to actually reproduce it. And the f you know of course the first step in debugging something is is being able to reproduce it. So in addition to being able to safely deploy things and promote them. You also can debug in the environment that you're actually having problems in, um, and so that's a that's a great feature to have. Um, you know, of course, there's some there's some weaknesses. If you um, you have to be very careful about um, backwards compatible changes. If you release a service that depends on some um, schema change that the, the previous version can't use, um, you know, you've made trouble for yourself. You can't roll back anymore. So you still have to be careful. But a lot of the um, the data they as well. So there's um, there's still a lot that we have to we have to do. Um, we have services that are running in isolation, and that's great. But we still have a great big monolithic database. Um, we have a we have some tooling around making sure that our um, our connections to our Postgres database are distributed nicely. Um, but it would be a lot better if we had um, individual data stores for um, for our services. The 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 problem with that right now is that we have um, we have very couple a uh, tightly coupled database, very tight, tightly coupled schema, and so before we can you know put this put this into Docker container or do something like Flocker, um, we have to tease apart what the actual services are. And that can be that can be very challenging if you have a um, a big ball of, a big ball of one. So in addition to, unti to untangling your mon untangling your monolith, you also need to consider how are you gonna um, how are you gonna handle your database. Uh, and I had also mentioned um, contract testing. So we're we're looking at a tool called Pat. Um, there they have a number of um, uh, languages they support. And what what Pat does is it's a um, uh, it's a library that you can use that does contract testing. So it will um, it'll record an interaction with your service against some mock. 
and rather than relying on the um, relying on your developers to test the downstream services, it can actually replay, replay that interaction against those downstream services. So you can use that as part of your certification icon. And so you can take away the um, uh, you can take away the, the human error from that. Um, I don't want to make a wholehearted endorsement of it because it's um, it's something that we're just trying out now. Um, I looked at it six months ago and it wasn't mature. Um, my recent investigations have shown that it's um, it has a lot of potential, so it, it might be worth looking into. Um, so that was a sort of a high level overview of how we um, how we've moved from a from a monolith into um, microservices using a pass. Um, and I want to take some time to uh, take some questions from you guys and see um, see if I can address the, the kinds of challenges that you guys are facing. Yeah. That we're we're using the just the um, the community edition. So uh, have no, no. Um, we have um, we have talked with um, with some of their developers. Uh, the we've hosted a few of the um, the NYC Mesos meetups. Um, so we've we've met we've met with them um, and we we've, we've made friends. But uh, we don't have any um, we don't have any official support. From them. Yeah. Um, we have found that the uh, the developers are fairly responsive though. Um, like if we um, if we post an issue on um, on GitHub, they'll um, they'll talk with us. It's not always we don't always get fast resolution, but um, you know they're they they do engage. It's not just talking into the, into the void. So what? Uh No, we're actually we're running in a in a data center. We have um, we have hardware that's um, that's running our running our slaves. Okay. Um, we uh, we use Puppet to manage those. Um, we uh, were able to sort of stamp them out. Um, there's there's some manual steps in that in that process still, um, but we uh, we just add slaves and um, and register them as we as we need them. The same with um, the same with master. Um, we have one data center with a colo. Um, there are five masters and eight slaves, I think. So it's um, it's not huge, but um, we have uh, we're we have fifty or sixty services that are that are running now. I don't know what our um, what our peak number is, but we have um, uh, it, they, most of our services are running um, three to five. Um, there are a few that have have some more. Um, our we don't have anything that's running um, even dozens of instances. We're using we're using Postgres and Mongo um, and Elasticsearch, and we also have um, we also have Zookeeper as a as a data store. Um, it's used you know mostly for configuration management, but um, but it, but it's also a data store essentially. Um, the our, our databases they're they're still monoliths. Um, we we started this 
six months ago. So all our services are talking to one um, to one database, or you know, a couple of Mongo instances, or our Elasticsearch instance, and uh, we're we're looking for something that will let us put those into containers. Uh, but as I said before, the you know we we're untangling our code, but we also have to untangle our data model. Um, there are at, when we first made the the venture into service oriented architecture. Um, uh, a mistake we made was that we would, um, one service would uh, do some action, write something to a database. Then another service would pick that up. So what you've done is you've made a, a non-local effect between two services. Um, you've taken state and um, just sort of smeared it around everywhere. And that's, um, uh, that's something you want to make sure that you avoid, um, essentially. Um, because then you, you have to tease that out, and that's, that's very challenging. Yeah, sometimes like, we'll choose to dive into our microservices, and I kind of almost a pretty good microservices, but that's not really the way that we're Yeah, um, we're, I'd, I'd love to get there. Um, the, one, of the, one of the reasons we haven't, um, we haven't done that is, is um, you, can, you can make a model for the, the data that your, um, your service might need. Um, and you can sort of treat that, that whole database, you can take a piece of it and treat it like it's, uh, it belongs to that service. Um, but then you have, to, you have to attach particular databases to, um, to your slaves, and we haven't found a, um, a nice way to do that, to be able to just give a Docker container uh, a database um, from, our, from our database server. The, um, we, we don't want to have to give all of the slaves all of the databases, and we don't want to make um, applications be able to put pressure on the on the Mesos infrastructure. We want to keep the infrastructure and the, the applications kind of kind of separate. So if um, I uh, I heard about Flocker yesterday, and that may be able to just go and request the database, and that gets mounted in the Docker container. Um, I hope that's how it works. I'll, I'll find out in the next couple of weeks. Yes. Uh, well, um, Cubic Bamboo is um, it's for writing HA proxy configs. Um, what it does is it listens. So Marathon produces a, an event stream, and every time something happens, um, from a, a failover to um, unfortunately just changing a tag, uh, Marathon will, will publish an event, and Cubic goes, "Oh, there's an event. I got to rewrite the HA proxy configs," and it does that. Um, which is which is great because you can move things around and they just have a they have a DNS name, um, so we have um, you know uh, customer service at yodo.com, and that's that's where that service lives. And HA proxy takes care of all of that all of that routing. Um, so all all Cubic does is um, is is listen for those events and make sure the HA proxy config is um, is as it should be right now. No, um, Mesos DNS the um, it wasn't mature the day that we looked at it. Um, so we went with, um, we went with Qubit. Um, I don't know that I would recommend that as a choice if you were, um, if you were starting out today, but um, we got it to work, we, um, we invested in it, and it's, um, it's functional. So um, I, I've heard good things about Mesos DNS. I can't say for sure that they, um, that it, it does what you'll need, but, um, but it's worth looking into if, uh, if you're starting out building a building a Mesos uh, pass right now. So in sort of the same vein as this database question, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we struggle with is giving developers their own sort of, I would say container, not actual container, but their own essentially private database to be able to write code against mm -hmm. uh, without affecting you know, staging or, or production necessarily. Um, so I'm curious in your experience, uh, given you guys have sort of like a model we have a we have a dev database. Um, so we have we have a um, three environments. We have dev, we have QA. We actually have a number of QA for, for various purposes, and then we have production. Um, and so the, the day to day stuff that developers are using, um, they use the dev database. Um, we have a, a sort of a clean schema that we apply every night. So if you've um, if you've destroyed the database, it'll be it'll be fine tomorrow. Um, uh, we have a process for being able to um, being able to put those back into uh, for, for being able to take the changes that you want and, and make them. Too. And how do you guys orchestrate that? 
the story is that you're setting this game? Um, it's a Jenkins job that um, pulls from a, um, a clean instance. So we have a we have a Postgres database that has the the snapshot, and we um, we do a, a, a dump in that bush. How do you do canopy testing when you have a database schema change? <coughs> Very good. <laughs> um, it's so we're we're able to do um, the when when we actually make the schema change that's uh, sort of outside of the outside of band for releasing um, Dockerized services. It's um, it's a it's a it's a careful manual process. Um, we we test it in dev. We test it out in QA. Um, we try and crawl cross it. Uh, any other questions? Okay. All right, thanks a lot.